So I would like to ask this question because it's very relevant to music educators. Uh, unless th the money that comes from the state government is going to be different than the money that comes from every other state government, there's not going to be a tremendous amount of money for music. Um, in New York State, we have something um, called NISTL funds, New York State textbook money. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they have that in Louisiana, but in, with that, principals get a certain allocation of textbook money. And since music is the textbook in a music class, and not all music teachers know that, yes. they're, they're allowed to get a share of that pot to buy music. But we all know that we're all guilty of making copies because we just don't have money to purchase music. And so that's the first part of my question because I know it's done and it's every time somebody does it, we all say, you know, you're not supposed to do that, but we don't have money to, to buy it. And on the other hand, and the other side of my question is how is all this stuff monitored? So okay. you can answer the first question first okay. and then well, it's, you're absolutely right about the first question and making copies. I'm, I'm coming more from a university background. Obviously, we have a College of Music and Fine Arts here. They have a license with ASCAP and BMI and CSAC for public performances. Also, um, there is a, a leniency on face-to-face -face performances in classrooms. So a music teacher and their students or I'm playing a bit of a CD to illustrate a point. The, down the line, it gets more complex when you're buying charts for the marching band or the wind ensemble or things like that. Um, then the best deal is to contact the publisher. They do have educational divisions. Um, and the same thing, uh, that issue comes up a lot in religious services and devotional things. Uh, although there are music publishers in the devotional field and they want their money because there's a composer who wrote the composition and should be for that. Now, I don't know how to answer that question with state funds and how to allocate that, but the second question about monitoring. One of the things the publisher does is to monitor all the deals that are going out there. Every quarter, for example, uh, the songwriter and the music publisher get a printout of surveys of public performances on the radio. That is a statistical estimation at best because there's something like 13,000 radio stations in the United States and think of how many music, uh, how many musical selections they can play per hour for 24 hours a day times 13,000. It's hard to aggregate all of that together. But the public performance societies, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, do that and they allocate. Every country in the world has something similar for public performances. In uh, England, it's PRS. Public uh, Performing Rights Society. In Japan, it's JazzRack. In Germany, it's GEMA, G-E-M-A. There's BUMA in Holland. All of these um, performance rights societies would collect for performances on Dutch radio or French radio. And if it's a US composer and publisher, there's a reciprocal agreement that Dutch money, Dutch performance money, goes to New York, ASCAP, BMI, gets spread around. Same thing. ABBA plays on the radio here, ASCAP BMI collects, they send it to Sweden. Um, the publishers are also the ones that do the deals with the, um, with the movie studios. And I'll, I'll tell you a really brief story. I was licensing a sync license of a New Orleans tune for a movie. So they uh, called up my client, who was a member of BMI, because you list your name and phone number, and that's how they find you. So he called me up. He said, these guys want to license a movie. And um, so they called me up, and I said, oh, OK, well, tell me, tell me what it's about. Because this song had not earned a penny since 1966. <laughs> how they found it, I don't know. Um, so he called me up, and he said, yeah, you know, we, we want to do this. We want to put it in a movie. Uh, I was like, 
okay, and I'm thinking, hey, any deal has to be a good deal. It hasn't earned a cent in, in you know, almost 40 years. So uh, I said, yeah, okay, tell me more about the movie. They go, well, you know, it's uh, this uh, director, uh, Robert Rodriguez. He's only made one movie before called El Mariachi. And we've got this new Spanish actor. We think we're, you know, he's going to be a hit and all. And so I said, all right, who's on, who's on the soundtrack? Who are the other people on the soundtrack? And they said, well, Los Lobos and Link Ray and all the people. And I said, okay, we'll do the deal. Fine. So the movie comes out. The movie's Desperado, right? <laughs> and, and it's a real big hit. So I go to see it in the theater, listening for the music. It's not there. And I call them up. I said, the check's good. You know, they sent me the money. The paperwork's fine. The, ch the check's good. We've already cashed the check and spent it. Um, thanks for paying. Where did you use it in the movie? Because I, I rented it on, on tape. This is how long ago it was. Um, rented it on tape. Play through. Couldn't hear it. Couldn't hear it. And they said, oh, it's in the barroom scene. It's playing on the jukebox in the barroom when Quentin Tarantino is telling the joke and then everybody shoots each other with machine guns. So you can't hear the song because everybody's shooting each other with machine guns. But still, they paid. And that is the essence of what a publisher does. He is using everything that he can to get money for the composition for his songwriter and ultimately for himself too. So any other questions? And no, I've never met Antonio Banderas, but... Uh. <laughs>